beginning they were saying, so in the beginning they said, well, young people had a low risk of catching the virus. Then they said, well, young people have a better chance of surviving if they catch the virus. Okay. Well, as a rule in healthcare, young people have a tendency to be healthier than older people, period. Okay. So whatever young people contract, they have a tendency to have better outcomes. So that being said, we don't know what this virus is really doing. We only know the basics. The basics have been great. Wash your hands, number one thing you can do, because this virus is hydrophobic. And what that means is this virus does not like water. And when you add soap to water, soap has surfactants in it, okay? And what surfactants do is once they're on your hands and they're mixed with water and you start rubbing your hands together, it causes whatever's on your hands to lift up off your hands, okay? Very simple. So when you rinse your hands with water and you add the surfactants, whatever's on there that you can't see is gone, okay? So that's the reason why soap and water works better than um, hand sanitizer. Now I'll tell you the thing about hand sanitizers that everybody needs to understand. Hand sanitizers do not wash hands, okay? They have never said that they were washing your hands. What they said was, we're sanitizing your hands. Now what that means is, if you put hand sanitizer on your hands, you're putting an alcohol-based substance on your hands. So whatever alcohol can kill, that's what the hand sanitizer would kill. The CDC does not recommend that you substitute hand sanitizer for soap and water. That's, I just want you guys to know that. Very important because a lot of people get a false sense of confidence when they say, oh, okay, I'm just gonna put some hand sanitizer on my, on my hands. All right, uh, where I work inside the medical unit in, in the actual clinic area, we have eight sinks in there, eight. All right, so I tell the nursing staff, wash your hands every time you pass the sink. The average American doesn't wash their hands, you know, 20 times a day. You typically wash your hands, you know, the way your grandmother or your mother or your father taught you to do it. You wash your hands before you eat. You wash your hands after you eat. You wash your hands when you touch something visibly dirty. You wash your hands prior to cooking. You wash your hands when you use the bathroom. That's typically how people do it. Okay, so with COVID-19, you have to do due diligence. Like I told the nurses, hey, wash your hands every time you see a sink, okay? Uh, that's a little game we're playing. Every time you walk past the sink, wash your hands. So maybe you guys can come up with a way where you can trick yourself into washing your hands more. And so the point of all that is, is I just want you to be, do your due diligence. Do your due diligence in protecting yourself, protecting your community, protecting your friends, protecting your family. Now I'm gonna quickly go over mask and then we're gonna get into the PowerPoint. So I think people are more empowered if they understand why they're wearing masks. Now I've seen and, and understand both sides of this political argument. I don't wanna wear a mask. I do want to wear a mask. I don't believe in what's happening with COVID. Da, 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 da. I've heard all the arguments. But let me just tell you the difference between masks and no masks and types of masks. First of all, the number one mask in the country, the N95 mask, that's the mask that's made by 3M. That mask is made here in the country. Now that mask was not actually designed for healthcare workers, okay? If you go on 3M's website, it'll tell you exactly who that mask was designed for. It was designed for people who work in the auto industry, welders, things like that, okay? The N95 
95 means that that mass has been certified by OSHA, and in California it's called Cal OSHA, um, to protect you from 95%, 95% of the time of particulate matter. And what that means is, is 95% of the germs that you cannot see cannot get through that mask. 95% of the time. That's where the number 95 comes from. Now, unfortunately, 3M was not prepared for this pandemic. And thanks to our great president, <laughs> they did not produce, increase the production of masks. Okay? And that was their right to do so because they were told they had to do it. Now think about if you own your own business and somebody comes and tells you what you have to do and what you can't do. You can decide I'm not going to participate, especially if you don't need the money, right? Okay. So let me just say this. It also, their website clearly states that those masks should only be worn an average of 20 minutes at a time and then they should be discarded. It also states they can be worn for up to 45 minutes and then they should be discarded. Okay. There's all kind of false information out there stating you can wear that mask for several days, you can wash that mask, you can um, you know, uh, set that mask down on the table and pick it back up and put it back on. It has a lifespan of a year. Well, let me just explain to you that is false, all right? You go on their website, the manufacturer clearly states that, sure, it has a lifespan of one year, but that's if it's still in the package. So it's just like anything else. If you open, your milk says once open, or you, know, you have to discard within 10 days or whatever, it's the same with the mask. Once you open it, put it on your face, and you wear it for more than 20 to 45 minutes, you need to discard that mask. The other key thing to note about an N95 mask is that it's a respirator, right? So when you put it on your face and you seal it to your face, now you're not breathing like you normally would breathe. So people who have like asthma, respiratory problems, things like that should not be wearing those masks. They're putting themselves at risk for carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide poisoning, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, the K95 mask is similar to the N95 mask. It's coming from China, all right? The problem is you got scam orders that are saying that they're actually making K95 masks and they're coming from China. The only difference between K95 and N95 is the people who test K95 are equivalent to OSHA but they're in China. So you can wear a K95 mask, but the rules for the N95 and the K95 are the same. Any questions about that? Okay. Now let's get to the handmade, homemade mask. They work just as good, and they're actually better for you. But let me explain to you what they do. A homemade mask does not protect you 95% of the time from 95% of uh, potential bacteria. It doesn't protect you from that. But what it does do is potentially reduce the risk of that bacteria getting on your face, on your nose, and you breathing it in. So basically, and it also protects people from you. So if you sneeze off, whatever, and you have on a mask, your homemade mask is going to reduce the chances of someone else catching it or you catching it from them if they're wearing a mask. So actually, it is a nice thing to do. It is a good thing to do, especially if you're going out, okay? And I always think of it this way. It might be an inconvenience. I might not want to, I might not feel like doing it today. On those days, I stay home. 
because I don't want to infect anyone else and I don't want anyone affecting, infecting me. You got little children out there who don't have strong immune systems and stuff. When I watched that rally uh, the other day with uh, Donald Trump and I saw people with their babies, I could not believe it. Because if you think about as a parent, as a parent, you might do a lot of risky things, but what parent goes around putting your child at risk intentionally? So I just wanted to share that with you guys because we have to take responsibility for our own health, okay? And this, this conversation is going to be how COVID-19 has disproportionately affected people of color, okay? So Donna, you're going to do the um, PowerPoint? Yeah. You're going to control it for me? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. I'm going to start here. This is just the beginning. And when I say people of color, I'm talking about everyone who is non-white. In America, I'm talking about Americans specifically. Okay, um, COVID-19, just like every other uh, disease in America, potentially affects people of color greater than it does people who are Caucasian. So I'm going to give you some of the reasons why, because there's a lot of studies being done about this. Um, typically, what, what they will say is this. First of all, you got to understand, we all know about racism. Okay? Racism, unfortunately, affects healthcare just like it affects everything else. You can go to the next slide, Anna. Okay. I can't see the words. Okay, um, all you have to do is go up to your um, your bar of people. Uh huh. And it's on the side. That's what it is. I need to move it. Either you can move it or you can um, hit that line at the top. Uh huh. And it, and it minimizes it. In, unless you want me to read the first part. <laughs> Um, yeah, you can, well, I can see most of it and I know what it says. So whatever I miss, just tell me. Okay. Okay. So it says at the top, nothing has stripped bare the disparities in U.S. healthcare more than COVID-19. Um, the virus may be an equal opportunity infector but it is selective in who it hurts the most and who it kills. African Americans and other people of color. So I'm just gonna address that part first. This virus, okay, doesn't care who you are, what color you are, how much money you have, how much money you don't have. It doesn't care about that, okay? All this virus cares about, it's not, it's not genetic specific or DNA specific or passed on uh, through um, hereditary um, circumstances or anything like that. Anyone who's next to someone who has this virus could potentially become infected. Okay. Now, it says, according to some estimates, African Americans are 2.7 times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID-19 than non-Hispanic. And let me just tell you what non-Hispanic means, white patient. Because, you know, when I study what does that mean, non-Hispanic white patients. Well, let me just tell you, when they say non-Hispanic, what they're saying is we're there is no, if you look at your census forms, there is no uh, definition for Hispanic, okay? 
I'm not really sure why that is. And I think it was because when they looked at calling people Hispanic, they just basically wanted to put everyone in the same category. So if you were from Mexico or Cuba or, um, or the Dominican Republic or um, uh, Brazil, places like that, okay. They wanted to say all of those people were Hispanic to make the census simpler to fill out. Does everybody understand that? However, if you were from Spain, you were considered to be white. So that's where that term comes from. Okay, non-Hispanic white patients and, and 2.4, so now Donna, I can't see that, it says time. Yeah, 2.4 times more likely to die. Okay, so we're still talking about African-Americans. All right. The next paragraph explains it somewhat. It says all of this unfolds against a backdrop of existing health in inequities, where Black Americans have higher rates of heart disease, asthma, hypertension, diabetes, and other illnesses. Furthermore, we are more likely to die from them. African Americans have the lowest life expectancy in the nation. Okay. So let me explain something. There's lots of reasons for this, okay? Some of those reasons are related to um, practices, okay? Some of them are related to practices. We all know if you smoke, you drink too much, you have a poor diet, um, those are things that could potentially lead to negative outcomes in terms of health care. Okay. But that's not the whole story for African Americans. Okay. People of color. People of color tend to have lower accesses to care, meaning they either don't have uh, medical clinics in their neighborhoods, they don't have health insurance, um, they don't have the money to pay, they don't have access to um, good food, because if you think about it, if you don't have a grocery store in your neighborhood and you're getting all of your food from McDonald's, Burger King, maybe the corner store, things like that, all this, and you're eating all this processed food because the local grocery store is four miles from your house and you don't have a car, you're not going to have access to help to a healthy diet, okay? So some of it is because of habits, and a lot of it is because of not having access to care, okay? And that has been proven. Statistics have proven that, that people of color typically have less access to care. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, Native Americans. It's interesting. I keep getting a request to come to Alaska and work at a hospital on an Indian reservation. Now, I would love to go, but I can't, okay? So Native Americans, think about this. They account for 1.3% of the infections across the nation, which is slightly more than their share of the general population, which is only 1.2%. The coronavirus has affected the Navajo Nation, a reservation across three Southwestern states with exceptional force. Okay. Part of the reason, same thing. Access to healthcare. They don't have it. They don't have access to healthcare. Okay, next slide. 
white Americans, I can't see the number. I know it's 32 or something like that. 36. 36% of coronavirus infections, and they make up 75% of the population, okay? That figure includes Hispanic whites, which I told you the difference between Hispanics from South America, what they consider to be Hispanic whites. And it drops to 60 point, what is it, four? Yes. Okay. So even the CDC <laughs> struggles with how whiteness is defined <laughs> because we're like, what? Okay, <laughs> what does that mean? Well, let me just tell you this. Caucasians in America, this, even though it's COVID-19 we're talking about, they typically fare better with any disease. It doesn't make any difference what the disease is, okay? And it's interesting. So African-American females with master's degrees and above, they did a study, still have higher incidence of infant mortality. Even if you compare it to a Caucasian female with lower than the eighth grade education. So now the question becomes, well, once you, because the politicians would say, well, it's because you, you know, uh, you know, the socioeconomic status of the person, that's the reason. So once you, as a person of color, have elevated yourself into a different socioeconomic status, it doesn't mean that you're going to fare better in terms of health care. Any questions on that? Okay, go ahead. You change the slide down. Okay. Now, this is what really, I believe as a nurse, and I have seen this, and I'm going to give you some examples. African Americans and Latinos are vastly overrepresented when it comes to coronavirus infections, according to an analysis released by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Now, I'm going to tell you as a nurse, I believe and they're studying it and they're trying to figure out why, but I believe that it has a lot to do with systematic racism, okay? And a lot of the systematic racism is covert racism. I've worked in hospitals where I worked for the very wealthy and I've worked in hospitals where I worked with the very poor. I'm sure you're familiar with Highland Hospital. Highland Hospital has a language line that has 110 different languages. So that tells you how many people are coming from all over the world to live in the Bay Area. All right. I have seen an experience where doctors and nurses either have conscious bias or unconscious bias. One of the physicians that I work with, which I was telling Donna about, Dear friend, Caucasian female, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I noticed that she was under-prescribing medication as far as I was concerned for people of color. So I'll just give you an example. This is not a real case where, that she worked on, but this is the way I said it to her when I brought it to her attention. So... A black man can come in with a broken leg and you'll give him some Motrin to go home with. I said where a Caucasian female can come in with a sprained eyelash and you'll give her morphine. So I need to understand why you keep doing that. And she was so offended by that statement. She started crying. She told me there's no way she would ever do that. She thought I was being cruel to her, that I would even suspect she was doing that because that is not who she is. And I honestly believe 
that she believed that. I honestly believe that there was no unconscious bias. But after going home and coming back the next day and talking to me, she admitted that maybe she was guilty of it, but was not aware of it. So I don't think, so I think some of it is conscious bias and some of it is unconscious bias. Okay, go to the next slide. Other people of color, Asian Americans, people of Hawaiian Pacific Islander background and people who identified as biracial or multiracial represent a much smaller share of the infected population. Why do you think that is? Does anybody? Why healthcare. do you think? Healthcare. Healthcare. healthcare, access to healthcare, absolutely. Access to healthcare. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So basically, the CDC is stating that Black and Brown communities have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. African Americans account for 13.4% of the population, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. But the CDC says they accounted for 22% of coronavirus infections studied in the new analysis. Okay, this is interesting. I love Dr. Dr. Fauci. And you notice we don't see very much of him anymore. Because I could tell when he stood on the podium and talked, he didn't take a political stance on either side. He was all about the health care. He was not, I'm here to support the Republicans or I'm here to support the Democrats. He was all about giving information to the American public. This is why I admire him. One of the things that he said, which stunned me, was he was absolutely honest about who would get a ventilator if needed and who wouldn't. And he made it very clear that if this, if we ran out of ventilators, people with comorbidities such as asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, things like that would not get a ventilator. Now, who do you think those people are? Okay, he made it very clear because at that point, we have to decide, this is what he said, who is going to survive if they get the ventilator and who is unlikely to survive. Now, I'm gonna tell you the truth. My black paranoia, <laughs> immediately went into overdrive, okay? And every African-American knows about black paranoia, all right? Now, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 30 years. I did some volunteer work over in Haiti after the earthquake. We didn't have enough ventilators. We didn't have enough oxygen tanks. We didn't have enough of anything. And we had to make decisions on who was going to get the ventilators, who was going to get the oxygen. That was one of the most painful things that I had to witness. And of course, I'll tell you who got them. It wasn't about money, because it didn't matter if you had money or not. We never knew because we weren't taking insurance or doing, um, stopping you at the front door. Can I see your insurance card? Can I, can I see, you know, how you're going to pay? It wasn't about any of that. It was about who was the healthiest. So basically, you know, if you were 80 years old, you weren't getting the ventilator. It was going to go to the 25 year old who may potentially survive. So I kind of understood where he was going with it. But then I also knew overwhelmingly who 
it was going to affect. So I immediately became really concerned about the fact that the hospital said you can't visit. Nobody can visit. And I kept thinking to myself, what do you mean nobody can visit? Okay, go to the next slide. Okay, so while many of these inequities are systemic and will need years to correct, this is according to Veronica Gillespie Bell, MD, um, New Orleans can take steps now to get better care whether you have symptoms of COVID-19 or another health issue. Very important advice. And let me tell you why this is important advice. Because a lot of times we don't do it. We don't go to the doctor. We, even if you have insurance, a lot of times you're like, I'm healthy, I'm not going. Okay. But preventative health care can help a lot to protect you and your family, especially your children. I had a, a, a man tell me that he snuck and took his children to get vaccinated because his wife refused to vaccinate them because she's under the impression that vaccinations potentially cause all types of problems, ADHD, um, you know, all types of learning disability. She's under the impression she doesn't want her children to have the immunizations. Okay. But then he told me, but she takes the dog to the vet <laughs> to get vaccinated to prevent the dog from catching diseases from other dogs. <laughs> okay. So he had to sneak his children to get them vaccinated. Smart man. Okay. okay. These are just some statistics. African Americans, 20%. White Americans, 15%. Others, 2%. This is in Georgia because I had the st statistics for Georgia. Other 2%, unknown 64%. These are the COVID-19 cases in this area in Georgia. Next. This is in DC, okay? Um, of course, African-Americans, whites, look at the number with Asians. We need to figure out what they're doing because whatever they're doing, they're doing right. Okay. Next. Okay, so this is important. Ways to ensure your health is taken seriously. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna tell you the absolute truth. And this is based on experience and this is based on research too. Find a physician who looks like you. Okay, if you can. And the reason why I say that, if you're a person of color, because I'm not saying discriminate against other physicians. That's not what I'm saying. But it's been proven. A physician who looks like you is probably going to understand you better. I've had patients come in who didn't speak English. And I've watched healthcare workers say, oh, well, I'm going to have to make them wait because we don't have a translator. But we do have a translator. The translator is on the phone. We have access to a translator phone. Now, let me tell you what you have to do. You have to go in the room and get the translator phone, roll it back and hook it up so that the translator who the company pays, whether they're translating or not, can translate. But I have seen people that are so lazy that they don't want to go get the phone and roll it in the room and get the translator. They'd rather make the person wait. So this is the reason why I say, if you can find a physician who looks like you, that's not always possible, but if you can, 
Know the facts about whatever it is you're going to the doctor about. Definitely know the facts about COVID-19. And at this point, if you go to the doctor for anything that's unusual, say it's out of the ordinary, say you, you know that you have high blood pressure and you're going to your routine appointment, just get your uh, medication renewed. Okay, that's fine. But say you've been having some dizzy spells lately or you know stomach problems or whatever lately, have, make them test you for COVID-19 and do not allow them to talk you out of it. Because what a lot of people don't understand is when you go to the doctor, the doctor works for you. It's not the other way around. When I was growing up, doctors were gods. They were gods. You didn't ask them no questions. You did whatever they told you to do. And, 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 and your parents, if, if, if they found out you were even challenging the doctor, you were going to be in trouble. The doctor was a god. Donna, do you remember Dr. Cooper in West Oakland? He was a god. But Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Mines were my two. Uh-huh. Gods. You never, we, were, we didn't have the luxury of um, being able to Google it, um, being able to research it, being able to uh, research medications and things like that. You got to understand, as a patient, the doctor works for you. Without patients, they don't get paid. The other advice I have is, before you go to the doctor, make notes for yourself. Now, I'm not saying, because it, it gets a little irritating when the patient comes in and says, well, I Googled it, <laughs> and I know that it's this, 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 and this. Okay, Google's not always right, but it does give you some insight. So make notes for yourself. Write down the questions you want to ask. Write down what your expectations are. Ask the doctors about potential tests um, and find allies. Allies is your family, your friend, your husband, your wife, your relative or whatever. Especially if you, if you know that you're being treated for any type of disease that could potentially be serious, do not do that on your own. You find allies because I have witnessed that the people who have family the people who have family are the ones that get the service. If your family is there advocating for you, if your family is saying that it's not okay, if your family is there saying, I insist that you get a translator, I insist, you get the service. Okay, next slide. So that's what this slide is all about. And it states, research shows that physicians of color provide better care to patients of color. It's just a fact. And I've seen it. Whenever I ran into a problem in the emergency room at Highland, and I couldn't convince one of the Caucasian doctors to help somebody for whatever reason, either they said they were too busy or they just didn't, they didn't think that it was as serious as I thought it was. And we're talking about new grads just stepped off uh you know out of the classroom and put on a white jacket i would always go grab the senior black attending doctor and i would go to her and say this is what is going on these are people of color they're ignoring it and i'm telling you it's very important that people of color understand that the doctors work for you and like i said i'm not going to accuse anyone of um, especially a healthcare worker, of it being racism per se, because I'm not sure about that. But I will say it could either be conscious bias or unconscious bias. Okay, next. That's the end. I wanted to talk about just a couple of other things right quick. I took some notes and I wanted to tell you guys the strongest predictor of health is socioeconomic status. That is the stronger, strongest predictor of health.
So if you want to know how healthy you're going to be, look at your bank book. And that's in America. Okay. And the interesting thing is when it comes to people of color, all right, the association between socioeconomic status and health is dependent on race. That is a fact. So as we see all of the uh, social unrest right now in America and we see the protesting and we see um, everything that's going on, the unsettled um, feeling the country has, the division and all of that stuff, it is very important to understand that racism just, it's not just about um, police officers uh, having un unconscious or conscious bias towards a black man who's driving down the street. It's also about our institutions, okay? Our healthcare, our um, access to adequate food, our access to education. You know, um, when I moved to Atlanta, Oakland was going through gentrification. Okay, when I grew up in Oakland, Oakland was like 60% African American. And there were a lot of African American businesses in the city. The city, all of a sudden, we knew in the early '70s that gentrification was coming because my father worked for um, an organization where they would do research on um, city planning. Okay, it was called Model Cities. If you ever want to know what the plans are for your neighborhood, say you're renting right now and you want to know what the plans are, you can go down to City Hall, because I used to go with my father all the time, and he would take me up to the planning division and they have to see you, let you see the plans. They have to let you see the plans. They cannot deny you access to them. And their plans are actually um, where they've decided what's going to happen over the next 30 years. So keep that in mind, all right? I talked about that. Another thing, breast cancer. Black women are less likely to get breast cancer. The instances of breast cancer in black women is very low. However, they're 40% more likely to die from it. Why is that? Why is that? You know? Um, and then, where you live matters. Keep that in mind. It's interesting that you expect people who live in rural areas to not have access to health care. They may have to drive several miles. They may even have to go, you know, several cities away to get good health care. You expect that if you live in a rural community. But if you live in a city like Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley, we should not be seeing those types of numbers. Okay. Um, so keep that in mind. Where you live, plays a part in it. The interesting thing is there's a lot of healthcare um, advancements being made now. Like we're having this Zoom meeting. There's a lot of doctors now that will see you via computer. But there's a lot of pushback to that too based on how do you build them. See, because it's all about money. Is your insurance company going to pay uh, a specialist to talk to you over the computer? So keep that in mind. At the end of this, I just want to say the most powerful thing you can do for yourself and your family is one, educate yourself. Two, educate your family. Three, stick together. And four, vote. Please, because I look at the protesters and I'm like, 
that's great. I love what you're doing. But if you don't vote, it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. So that's it for me. Any questions? Can we give, um, can we unmute and give Nurse Tina um, a round of applause? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, also, if anyone has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just speak. You know I'm waiting for you, Melissa. I know you got a question on your mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was going to... Um... I, I don't know, like, uh, I was kind of watching um, the movies you posted, so, and, like, hearing you speak about living in Oakland and everything, it's just, um, it's crazy to me that things like, like, Nurse Tina was saying, there's so many hospitals, and so much health care, like, how is it not, I don't, I don't understand how it could be so biased still in a community, like, that is what I'm saying, it just, it kind of trips me out. I don't know if it's a question. It's not really a question, but it's just, it's interesting. Well, but think about this. Think about this. Why is this country still struggling with this? Why are we still fighting over the color of people's skin? You would think that the country would say, the more powerful the people are, the more educated the people are, the more uh, healthy the people are, the more powerful the country will be, the more educated the country will be. But why are we still struggling with this? I don't understand it. You know, I'm 56 years old and I, you know, in the 60s and early 70s, my parents were activists. And they told us about all of this. But you know, as a child, through a child's eyes, you never really see it the way they do. They told us about voter suppression. They told us about all of that stuff. It wasn't until I got to Georgia, I just stood in line for four hours to vote in the Georgia primary. Now, let me tell you how this voting thing is. First, I got a, I, I, I planned on voting by mail, which I'm glad I didn't. Because now lots of the mail-in ballots are missing. Okay. Faulty. Yeah. So first I got a couple of months before the election, I got a ballot sent to me. It said absentee ballot on the front. I set it on my table because I said, well, it's two months before the election. I'll fill it out in a couple of weeks. I opened it up a few weeks later, and on the inside, it said, if you want an absentee ballot, you have to mail this in before this date. I had missed the deadline. Because the language was to deceive me. On the front, it said absentee ballot. Mm -hmm. So then I said, I'm going to do early voting. I'm going to do early voting. So I go on the website. They said the early voting was going to be at the Fulton County Administrative Building. That they were open from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's what the website said. I left work early that day. Got to when pick my daughter up. We both went. And when we got there, there was a big sign on the door saying we're closed due to COVID-19. So there was no early voting. But do you think that they would have changed their website? And I thought about all of the elderly people who don't have access to transportation and things like that. Maybe they're catching a bus, or maybe they're having a friend bring them, or their children are taking off work or whatever. Because I'm thinking about, you know, elderly people vote more than anybody. They yeah. are the highest group of voters. When I say, and now I understand why. You know, my parents gave me uh, 
voter registration card for my 18th birthday. I thought I was going to get a car or some money. <laughs> when I opened up that envelope, there was a voter registration card in there for my 18th birthday. And when I said, oh, what happened to the car? What happened to the buddy? They said, that's better than a car. It's better than money. So this healthcare stuff is just like everything else. And if, if, I, if I can't get you to take anything away from this conversation is I want you to understand that. And so in order to change it, we have to advocate for it. We have to advocate for it, you know? So my role as a nurse, I'm the nurse manager at the jail is I do teaching to the officers and I do teaching to the staff because I'm coming from a different place in terms of perspective simply because I came from California. Simply because I came from California. I didn't even realize that when you cross over into a different state, you really, it's almost like going to a different country. It's amazing. It's amazing the different perspective. So to get them to understand that you have to advocate, you have to advocate for other people of color. Atlanta has a limited um, race base. It's, you're either black or you're white. There's very few other races here. So it's a small number. And I think that's why that statistic was that way. Mm -hmm. Very small number. So that seems to be where they're locked at. They're locked right there. And they can't see the bigger picture outside. I call it 285. That's the, that's the uh, highway that circles this city. I live inside of 285. But to get people to think outside of 285 and what changes you have to make to improve health care. Now, the uh, Affordable Care Act did help in a lot of ways. It helped in a lot of ways. You know, Unfortunately, it wasn't perfect. But it was better than nothing. There's something like 20 million more people in this country that have health care because of it. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, that was a good vote. That was a good vote, you know. So I have another question then. Um, because of, they're not really, like, do you feel, like, is it true that they'll just get an adequate care considering that it's, like, lower cost as, or free? Because my friend, no. uh, yeah, he works for Medi-Cal as a okay. therapist and he was telling me it's actually it's a it's a two-way street kind of um because they're not paying for it sometimes they'd skip sessions or skip appointments and that's I what you're saying the frustrating part about it is however it's like he's very educated he's like it's his first job how like he doesn't have much experience but at the same time it's like he's saying like it, it is about balance i I don't know. It's been a while since I've been on Medicare, so I don't really remember like the healthcare system so much through that. Um, I, I know that going to Planned Parenthood seems like the same concept as well as going to Kaiser. Like I didn't experience anything different, but um, it's just what I don't know. Like I can't. Like I don't understand why it's still. Like I know what you're saying. It's systematic racism. At the same time, it's like it's frustrating because it's like you're saying, oh, okay, we have hospitals now like there's like i said i live in oakland and there's hospitals and places for people to go however what like it's just because of this is why they're not getting adequate health care it's not money anymore because it's money too right it's money it's um institutional racism it's lack of knowledge um it's just a variety of reasons. When you were telling me us about the um, breast cancer statistic, that is just profoundly, like, it, it just baffles me. It's like, I, the, I have no words for that. <laughs> it trips me out. Absolutely. Inadequate care. That's just point blank. Exactly. And, that's why it's so important to educate yourself about Whatever it is, if you find out that there's something wrong with your body, you need to do as much research as you possibly can. Got it. You, you need to do as much research as you possibly can, and you need to have an ally. It is right. so important. 
don't go alone. Take right. your family with you. Somebody that can speak for you if you can't speak for yourself, you know? Yeah. Those are the, those are the patients who get the best care. When they have somebody standing there saying, hey, my mother's in pain, then it's real hard for the healthcare worker to say, oh, well, I'm going to make the patient wait. The patient might not be able to complain, but this family member that's sitting there can complain. Yes. And a lot of people don't know every hospital in, in this country is required to have a patient advocate. So there is a person that works in the hospital that does nothing but advocate for patients. That's their job. That is in every hospital in this country. And you and can no one, ask for the patient advocate. No one tells us that either. It's like you don't know. Well, no one wants you to know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't tell you that because, <laughs> because then, because they have to answer to the patient advocate. So if you can't speak for yourself, the patient advocate, and you don't have family, the patient advocate can speak for you. That's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Uh, this is Pedro. Hello. Hi, Pedro. Hi, Pedro. Uh, I'm curious about the mask. You're talking about the M95 mask or N95 masks? Yes. <clears throat> um, let's see. I was curious. I had a question earlier and I lost it while I was listening to you. Sorry about that. Um, That's okay. You can email me okay. if you think of it. And I'll be happy to answer your question. You, All right. Thank what's, you. Yeah. What's your email again, Tina? Is Mrs. Tina Wright. That's W R I G H T. My name is spelled T I N A. I'm can putting it in the chat. chat. Just, oh, okay. You can put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So, Miss Tina Wright. Mrs. 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 Tina Wright. 7691. 7691. At Yahoo. Okay. Yep, yeah. that's it. Okay. I have a comment. Um, I. I was listening earlier on the news about an incident that happened here. I, I believe it was in the Bay Area where it was um, a mother, her one-year-old child, and her mother. They were at um, Yogurt Land standing in line. And when she began to speak to her mother in Spanish, a lady that was standing behind them took her mask off and coughed oh, towards her one-year-old child like three times. Oh. Um, when I hear things like that, it's appropriate to this conversation to talk about things like that. When certain groups are targeted, um, it's not okay to put someone's health at risk, especially um, a child whose system is very, very sensitive and delicate. Um, how could you, how could anyone do something like that? Well, all I could say is the woman should have been arrested for it because let, let me just say this. Isn't that assault? Remember, it's assault. Assault. <laughs> it's assault. Do you remember when um, HIV first came on the scene? Mm -hmm. People were doing things to intentionally infect people, and they went to prison for it. Absolutely. You know, if, as far as I'm concerned, not only is it assault, it's assault with a deadly weapon. Okay? And the bottom line is, I'd have lost everything that day if I was that mother. I would have lost everything that day. Everything. Because I would have gave her what she came for. <laughs> okay? No, I okay. understand. I understand. You know, and I could, I, 
was humbled by the mother's ability to hold it together. But, and, and what she did was share the incident with the media and, and the police. So I applaud her for that, but at the same time. Well, look at your president. Your president, your president's on the stand saying Kung Fu virus. Right. He said he could give it 18 different names during his Kung Fu virus. So now, so now, how is the Asian community supposed to respond to that? You got people who are looking to blame somebody. How can they protect themselves? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And this is human nature to want to blame somebody. It's interesting. It's human nature to want to look down on other people. You know, I'm up here and you're down there. That's human nature. Okay. So, of course, they want to blame somebody. So, let's blame the Asian community. I have lots of Asian friends that, that have never been to China. Okay. <laughs> They're like, I'm, I'm Chinese, but I've never even been to China. You know, and so the bottom line is, so you're going to say, let's blame the Asian community. Pedro, do you mind if I um, mute you? Oh, sorry. Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll mute myself. Okay. Yeah, so I hate to hear that. Um, I have my own <laughs> experiences as a, uh, a black woman. Yeah. And how I'm treated. Yeah. So it, it affects everybody. Yeah. It affects everybody. But it affects people of color differently than it affects other groups. Right. Mm -hmm. It definitely does. It's hurtful. I just have to say, it's just hurtful. It is. But if it I really had... Go ahead. At the beginning of the year, I seen a news story about a man who was going around only infecting black women with HIV. And so they made a whole case out of it because it was like, he had a, a, like a record of them, like 200 black women. Yeah. On I know exactly what you're talking about. I've seen that too. Yeah. So I was so, it was just crazy when I seen it. Cause like, who, like how evil do you have to be to do that to somebody? you don't even know and then you do get to know them and you still think it's okay well a lot of it has to do with the president and dehumanizing people of color um and it's been done absolutely for all the presidents that have been that elected based on fear of of race color you know dehumanizing latino people black people asian people it's easier to see them as less human um when you're dehumanizing them especially like in in middle america midwest um where you don't have a lot of diversity um people just believe whatever they hear and if you hear your president saying it it must be true yeah <sighs> yeah it amazes me just living in the south i'm just i'm just blown away by it. it's amazing to actually witness it to actually witness it you know, I'm like, am I in the 50s or what? Yeah. It's a big change from the Bay Area. Um, I Huge. Moved to the Midwest. I moved to the Midwest in 2008. Um, I just moved back to California. Um, but the racism that I've dealt with out, out here is ridiculous. Um, direct, straightforward, to your face racism that is so normal um, to treat people that way. Um, it's, it's, it's insane. Yes, it is. Can you clarify, Pedro? Did you say racism out here in the Bay Area or back in the West? No, in, in, the, in the Midwest. Oh. In the Midwest. Because we do have racism in the Bay Area. Um, moving back, after, after moving away from the Bay Area to the Midwest and being able to see it um, out here for, like, the, the big mentality out here and the way they treat people, and then going to the Bay Area and seeing it a lot less just because we have so much diversity and a larger population of, um, of people, you know, from different cultures, we still have it in the Bay Area. Um, it's very much alive. But in the Midwest, it's like, it's night and day. It's so out in your face. Like people just say things and talk about things like it's nothing. They, the racist jokes are just nonstop to your face. 
you know, um, it's, it's crazy. It is. Those, in, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I love California, but California is one of the most racist, racist states in the union. I hate to say that because it's hard for me to believe that, but I'm going to tell you what I'm basing that on. California has the highest incarceration rates than any other state in the union. And who do you think those people are that are incarcerated? Black men and people of color. That's right. 40% of the population in jail. And then that's right. Reading the, we're like 11% or something um, within the population. That's right. It's a little over 12%. And California economy is based on uh, incarceration. It's one of the highest um, money makers for California based on taxation. Because they have such a large amount of employees who depend on the Department of Correction for their income, their, the taxation from their employees brings in a lot of income for the state of California. And California is very aware that this is what they're doing. And they continue to build prisons. And believe me, they're not building them for Caucasians. Mm -hmm. So when I look at racism, I don't just look at, you know, oh, I was walking down the street today and they called me a nigga. I also look at things like that, that institutional racism. The class is sad. Finished, uh, watching the documentary 13th and responding to some questions around that. Um, so yeah, this continues the conversation that we just left off on on Friday. Mm. Thursday and Friday. Yeah. Yeah. I I was having a debate with a friend of mine from California actually. Um, she's Caucasian. Um, but yeah, her mindset and her support of Trump for, for her reasons. And it's hard to explain to some people that just don't want to listen, you right. know, that, that it's there. And it's like when, when it doesn't affect you, when you don't see it, and when it doesn't, you know, it just, they don't think that it's true because they've never had to struggle through, you know, those things. Um, yeah, it's, it's insane. Mm -hmm. Or don't even like just bother to listen to understand anything. Um, like, in my line of work just w working with individuals and just not even talking about racism just in things in general they're so quick to be like combative and i'm like well just listen and have an open ear and 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 just like learn yeah, you might not experience yeah, it I, uh, but let's just can let's can just can listen and and, and so you can grow from it and then because you may not be experiencing help the next person that is experiencing Obviously. and it's just mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes I have no words but then some days I have all the words but sometimes it is no. yeah sometimes I think it's kind of muscle memory like I've thought this way all my life so this one conversation is not going to change the way I think even though I might understand or try to understand where you're coming from today it's not going to change how I think overall so some of it is just um, not willing to even listen and some of it I'm willing to listen but I may not be willing to change the way I think overall and that, and that both are difficult both are difficult anyone else okay well, Miss Tina, do you have um, anything more you wanted to share with the class? Um, not that I can think of. Um, I will say that the inmates are safer than you guys <laughs> because we're protecting them from COVID-19. Right. <laughs> you know? And, and isn't that bizarre? We have, um, they're all in single cells and the walls are made out of brick. 
So <laughs> COVID-19 cannot penetrate a brick wall and there is no, um, no windows. So they're all in self-isolation. Isn't that terrible? It's horrible. I know, but at the same time. But we've only had one case of COVID nineteen. How are they dealing with that mentally? Um, because you know, self isolation is such a tough process in general for um, for people. Up. So I just wonder how they're dealing with that mentally and emotionally. Okay. Interestingly enough, okay. So as you know, mental health. Um, we get a lot of inmates who have mental health problems because unfortunately, we don't know if the mental health caused the problem with law or it was being incarcerated caused the mental health. We don't really know. Um, but in this time, the inmates are interested in being self-isolated because of COVID-19. It wasn't forced on them. They agreed to it. They don't want to be exposed to COVID-19. Okay. That's the interesting thing. So it's funny how the disease actually brought the community inside the jail to work together. Right. To prevent it. The staff don't want it. The inmates don't want it. And it's, it's interesting. Working. It's working. But there, there is just like anything else. When you make people uh, responsible and let them have some autonomy, then they work better, you know, because they're in on it 100%. They're like, we don't want this disease. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. Would you say the the temperament inside the jail is um, pretty relaxed or peaceful, or how would you describe it? I would say that it's scary, just like everywhere else. You know, it's scary. When the inmates come out of the cell, they have to wear a mask. Um, those that refuse to wear a mask can't come out of the cell. So if you want to come out, you have to put it on. We've had a few that say, I don't want to put that mask on. And then it's peer pressure, mm -hmm. which is interesting to me because the officers don't have to say anything. It's the other inmates saying, man, look, if, you had, if you're not putting that mask on, you're not coming out. So um, it's tense, mm -hmm. just like everywhere else. It's tense. Mm -hmm. But they have lower numbers than the general community. So something is working with what they're doing because we've only had one. Well, they're like, well, we don't want any. How about that? Right, so we don't want any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's scary. I hear you. Um, yeah, being separated from the uh, from the outside world. Um, as during this, I was talking about. Well, e yeah, definitely during this time, would be much worse for them. So yes, I know fear is causing them to act the way they're yes. acting or behaving right now. Mm hmm but they're in a healthier space. Yeah, but it's, and it's so be, bizarre. Yeah. It's so bizarre because um, Emory University yes. is studying us. Yes. Mm -hmm. They have students that are studying us and keeping statistics on us, and it's, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I could be a part of that, though. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're a part of this. Me too. Because you <laughs> brought a, a very important piece mm -hmm. uh, for my class, for me as well as my class. I learned quite a bit today as well, 
even more mm -hmm. in this talk than I learned in our initial conversation about this, about you mm -hmm. being able to talk to the class. So I think- One other thing, mm -hmm. do any of your students have small children? I do. Okay, do not I give do your- well. Georgia Poison Control put out an alert for parents saying do not give your children hand sanitizer because children are drinking it. You know, the hand sanitizer comes in those little cute little bottles with, you know, little cartoon characters on them and, and stuff like that. And people are giving them to their kids and they think they're protecting their kids. I tell them here, you know, if you can't wash your hands, use the hand sanitizer. But children are children and they will drink it. So they've having more kids come into the hospital with alcohol poisoning. So be careful. And then they can't even, the, the parents can't even go with them in the hospital, right? Exactly. And then who, who, who knows what they're giving them? Is it, well, see, a lot of times parents don't, don't realize that the, that the hand sanitizer is like 60% on average alcohol. So I just wanted to let parents know that. So tell your friends if they have kids, small kids, do not give them hand sanitizer. Yeah, even though the recommendation was 70%, uh, when many of the stores started to run out of the 70 and only the 90% was available, many people used the 90. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Again, that, that's a much more toxic product, not good right. for animals or small children. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you said you guys only had one case of COVID. Yes. And was that was that individual like showing symptoms or what was going on? How did you fever? Anything? Totally symptomatic. Mm. Totally asymptomatic. No symptom. We test. We do. Um, we take everybody's temperature every day. So when, since they were asymptomatic, how, what was the indicator? We tested everybody. Okay, but if she never showed any symptoms, um, so it was just the test result that, that indicated? It was the test result. Okay. Yeah, no, we tested everybody because we're part of the study at Emory's story. Mm -hmm. We only had one that came back positive. Mm -hmm. Did that patient ever become symptomatic? I guess no. that's the question. No. So just the carrier? Yep. Mm. yep. Okay. The tricky disease. Hello. Okay, hold on please. I um I know I said this last week, but I, I work in the unsheltered community and I'm I'm a case manager and so um we had a few individuals that tested positive, no symptoms, nothing, and um they eventually came back. They went to isolation and everything in a hotel and they came back and I was like, Hey, any symptoms? Like, you know, because they, they did their quarantine period and they were like, No. I'm like, Okay. Like yeah. a lot of people are just carriers. Right. The thing is, they carried on to the wrong person or somebody immunocompromised, and then that's where the downfall is. Right. So it's, it's, it's really unfortunate. And then you have, I guess, the CDC coming out with a bunch of new information on a regular basis and right. contradicting what they said. And at this point, everybody's looking at each other and they're like, well, let me out of quarantine <laughs> or let me out of right. shelter in place. Because right. we don't like, it changes so often. Right. But we all know we got to wear a mask. <laughs> wear a mask. Yeah. Oh, that, that was my question with the mask. I'm sorry. This is Pedro again. Um, the, I was reading somewhere the World Health Organization was saying that there's no point in everyone wearing masks um, 
that only the people that are showing symptoms or have been tested positive for um, was the way to that. So I was just curious about um, your opinion on that. I like I said I didn't even go on the website. I read somebody posted it, so I don't even know if it was real. It's it's not you. true. Let okay. me. That's not true. Let me tell you something. That's another piece of advice I can give you. Whatever you do, do not get your information about COVID nineteen or any other disease from social media. Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you want information about any disease, do not get it from social media because people are putting bad information out there. And because of bad information, you get people who, who believe it. Like uh, on Facebook, there was someone who put on Facebook that there is already a cure for COVID-19 and they're giving a vaccine to dogs. Well, first of all, the dog thing, it said canines, and it was in small print. If you weren't wearing your glasses, you would have missed that part. So people were all in an uproar, like, oh, they've got a, a, a cure for COVID-19, and they're not giving it to us. You got see? it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have to be careful. You want to get consider the source. Go on World Health Organization website. Is there? They yeah. go on your your local county health website. Um, your Department of Public Health, um, the CDC website. These are all uh, legitimate sources. Okay. Yeah, I'm on the World Health Not, Organization website now. Yes. Do your research that way. And then, like I said, no one's going to make anybody wear a mask. And if you have uh, asthma, respiratory problems, things like that, you shouldn't be wearing one anyway. But the bottom line is, it's not going to protect you 100%, but it's going to give you some additional protection. So you got to make up your mind. Nobody can force you to do it. Make up your right. mind. What do you want? Yeah, well, I mean, you I'm going to use my, I'm going to, I'm going to use a mask either way. Um, but it's just to, to either debunk other people's ideas of it or people that are questioning whether or not they should use it. Um, just the best information to pass on to others, I guess, is really the reason I was asking the question. And let me tell you something about viruses, because people have a misunderstanding about how viruses travel. Most people think if somebody sneezes or coughs in your face, it's going to hit you coming straight for your face like this, right? Okay. That's not how viruses travel. Viruses travel like this, okay? So when they're coming out, when someone sneezes, and the virus, it comes out of their mouth as my hand opens up. Imagine the virus is going to be doing like this. And that's the reason why it can land on somebody on the right of you, on the left of you, behind you. Because viruses don't travel straight. Because you can think, oh, well, as long as I stay away from people and they're not looking right at me. The person can cough behind your head and it can still get you okay yes ma'am makes sense so wearing a mask is definitely you know it's just another preventive measure you can take to protect yourself protect your family protect your community you know and it's not that hard to do so I have, a, I have a follow-up question about the mask wearing. Um, when you are like at a park or something, like like in your own little area, or taking your dogs out on a walk with nobody around outside, it's not you, necessary. That's you that's what have, I was. You don't have we, to wear a mask for that. Okay, thank fresh you. Fresh <laughs> air is the fresh air is the best thing you can get. So this virus, because of its density. It's a very heavy virus. It's, it's actually heavier than all the other COVID viruses. This is not the first COVID. So 
this virus is very dense. It has a very huge fat layer on the outside of it. A fat layer on the outside of this virus is to protect it from water. Okay. So if you think about if you think about bacon frying in a pan and it's got a fat layer on the outside, that's how this virus is made. All right. So it makes it heavy. It's very dense. So it only floats around in the air for a short period of time. Now, the, the question is, what is that short period of time? Is it two hours? Is it an hour? Is it three hours? That's, that's still considered a short period of time. It's not mm -hmm. like TB, which is very light and can float around the air for long periods of time. So if you think about bubbles, you know, and how they float around. So TB can stay up there for a while, where, where COVID cannot. It can only stay up there for a short period of time. And because of its density, it's going to fall down slowly. And it's going to land on something. That's why the most powerful thing you can do is wash your hands. Because nine times out of 10, that's how you're going to get it. You know, I've been going to work ever since this thing came out. I've been wearing the same pair of shoes to work. Same pair of shoes. I leave my shoes outside on the porch before I come in the house. I come in the house. I leave them outside. I spray them down with Lysol. I put them on the next day. I'm so sick of those shoes. You know, but it's going to give me an excuse to buy new shoes once this is all over with. Bottom line is, I, I do it because I know that COVID's on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to walk it into my house. So I'm trying to do everything I can. I wash, once I've been outside, once I've been to work or whatever, I wash my clothes every day. Every day they go in the, in the laundry because I'm trying to prevent bringing COVID into my house. Even your hair. COVID can land in your hair and it can sit there for, for a while. And that's the reason why they wear your hair back. Because if you think about how often you touch your hair, mm -hmm. it's just like touching your nose, rubbing your eyes, whatever. Same thing with your hair. You don't even realize how often you do it. If it's behind you, it becomes more of a task to reach back for it and start playing with it. You know, so we just have to think about, change the way we think about things. That's why I was encouraging you guys to wash your hands more often, maybe play a game with yourself. One of my friends says she washes her hands every time she sees a doorknob. <laughs> so, you know, this this virus is so tricky, and and it's hard to fight an invisible opponent. You can't see this, you know. So, think about that. I'm not sure if anybody have asked this yet, but um, do you think it'll be over at all? I do. The the. The luckiest thing that could happen for us is because, as you know, viruses mutate and they mutate fast and they mutate, they mutate a lot. Most viruses will mutate to the point where they're not as contagious as they used to be, or even if they are as contagious as they used to be, because of the mutation, they're not as deadly as they used to be. So the hope is that the virus is going to mutate itself out of virulence. So it won't be as much as, as as infectious as it is now. Will it disappear? Probably not. Most viruses don't. But will it change? Definitely. And if not, they'll come up with a vaccine, hopefully. Um, but that's what I'd like to believe. And that's based on what other viruses do. Other questions? Sorry, I have another question. Sure. Um, if say anybody can answer this, but I'm just wondering if you, if they do come out with the vaccine, will you guys rush to go get the vaccine? Mm. <laughs> That's my coworker. We were having a discussion about this earlier, so she's listening. Um. It's, it's, yeah, that's a great question. I won't, 
<laughs> yeah, I was like, uh, I, you know what? I hate to say this, but I'm going to let them get it first. <laughs> Whoever and them it, is, right? Yeah, that's it. And Whoever it's the it, first people. And it's it. based on, it's based on my black paranoia, <laughs> which I do own at times. I own it. Okay. And I have good reason for feeling that way. I just gave you a whole bunch of statistics on why I feel that way. Bottom line is, I'm going to let them get it first, and I'm going to see how well they do. And then I'll get it. I would get I believe, it. Oh, yes. I sorry. believe in vaccinations. You're good, Melissa. You can unmute. I was going to say, I would get it because I don't have kids. I am a little bit younger and I feel like you need trial and error. I'm not saying like I want to get sick from it. However, it's like the more people that get it and they trial and error for people that might be more susceptible, then by all means, let me do it for others, you know? It's like, I agree. That's, a good, that's <laughs> great. If I had children, it would be a different question because you're thinking yeah. about others at that point. Somebody's got to get it. It's the only reason why. <laughs> yeah. Was there was there ever a conversation? This wait, sorry. No, go ahead. Was this virus man-made? This was this a man-made virus or no? <laughs> I know I this know, conversation of where it came I from. don't know where you got that information from. Do not get your science from Facebook. Do you understand me? Okay. I don't have a Facebook, so no, I didn't, I didn't get it from Okay, <laughs> well, I'm not a millennial. What do millennials have? TikTok or Twitter or whatever. <laughs> Let me just tell you, go and get your science from the science community, okay? Do not get your science from social media. All right. Social media, they specialize in whatever they specialize in. The gossip network, sharing information about nothing, you know, or whatever. But the bottom line is that is not science. Okay. All right. Okay. These are great questions. They are. Great questions. They are. So any more? Don't feel like you're talking too much. If you wanna say something, it's it's good. Mr. Jones? Okay, I don't know. Okay, anyone else? I just want to confirm the definition of exposure also. Okay. Okay. Um, I working with the unsheltered guests, we we've, we've talked to like Alameda County and healthcare for the homeless and things of those nature. And what we receive as exposure is um, within six feet of someone who actually has the virus and um, and without a mask on and you're talking longer than fifteen minutes. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay. My cat is knocking at the door. <laughs> Enough. Okay. Um, all right. So you know that the person has the virus. Is that is that it? Is that no. this scenario? No. So you don't know the person has the virus. And you're talking to them and it's less than six feet away, mm -hmm. and you're talking to them for 15 minutes. Yes, with, without a mask on. Without a mask on, and they didn't have a mask on. Right. Okay, you've been exposed, if that person is positive. Well, I just wanna make sure, like, that's the definition of exposure yes. for contracting COVID, okay. Yes, you've been exposed. Mm -hmm. So this is another reason why you should have a mask on. This is why. 
because you want to protect yourself. Do you all provide masks for the population that you're interacting with? Yes. Great. You have to wear a mask. You have to, yeah, you have to wear a mask once you step foot on property. Good. Unless you're eating, sleeping, or drinking. That's about it. But no, you have to have a mask on. And we've been, we got them donated. We bought some. We have, people make them. yeah, people were making them. Everything. We started out with paper towel masks with the rubber bands and the staples. And then, yeah. Then we just got some donated and they have strings and they're reusable. That's and so, yeah. Anything is better than nothing. Right. <laughs> Anything is better than nothing. And sanitize your environment. You know, I'm not saying, you know, drive people crazy. I have one nurse that I work with and she is just like the sanitizer demon. She's like coming behind everybody. Every time you sit down, she, as soon as you get up, she's got the bleach out wiping it. And I'm like, okay, you're killing us. <laughs> so, but yes, sanitize your environment. Do you recommend Microban? That's a big a product that uh, is really popular on the market right now to sanitize your your home. I use it. Mm -hmm. I use it. But regular soap and water works just as well. I don't know. It's like those types of products just make you feel better. Right. We all know that. Bleach is probably the best product in the world, but it's not made for drinking, okay? <laughs> I mean, you know, so you have to, and then you have to think about who's in your environment. Like with me, I've got my little grandson. He's only 16 months. I can't have him like sticking his hand and he's putting his hands everywhere. I can't have him sticking his hands on bleach and then putting it in his mouth. So you have to think mm -hmm. about who's in your environment. And then decide what you're going to use. Well, for babies, um, like, because I have um, niece and nephews, so, like, I, like, got them, like, a couple toys, and, like, I took them out of the packages. And then I also, like, ha I, I know it's ridiculous, but I wiped it down with alcohol, but I let it dry for a day. Yeah. And that's fine, right? That's fine. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I know everything goes in their mouth, so. Right. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, you were saying sanitize, you know, I just took a microbiology class. So it's like, she was telling us like, there's, oh, for instance, even hand sanitizer. It's like, you're killing right. all the good microbiota as That's well as right. when you over sanitize, therefore you're not getting any sort of um, bacteria on you. Yeah. That's and right. You'll become resilient. So that's is, there, right. is that what you're talking about? That crazy woman that's bleaching and everything is like, that's just too much. It's just to... too much. It's overkill. Yeah. Like that's your what shoes. Gonna, you got to remember your body's got good bacteria and what they call pathogens. Pathogens are the ones that are, infect you with something. And then you've got good bacteria on your hands and your nose, on your face and everything. And it helps build your immune system, you know. So we've we've already become like, especially in the hospital, those hospital acquired diseases that you get when you come, you get only get them at the hospital. Okay, those diseases are because we over sanitized, and we created these super viruses like. MRSA, methicillin resistant staph aureus, that you only get that in the hospital, you know, and it's because we over sanitized. So it's, it's, it's how do you win the thing? I don't know. I don't know. Just do due diligence, put your mask on, wash your hands, you know, and try as hard as it may be. Try to pay attention to how often you touch your face. I, know. I didn't realize it. Try sitting still for 15 minutes and not touch your face. Try it. I touched my face just a second ago and I was thinking. I touch my face different. all the time. <laughs> and I still. Gonna, you watch, it, watch it. I mean, touching my face. I, I, I do it all that. the time. Mm -hmm. I do it all the time and, and trying to avoid doing it 
it's like, I can't believe it. I must have adult ADHD or something because I can't sit still, you know? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I can feel there's more. Blueberry. Well, she, she answered my question about, because I was going to ask, like, can we over sanitize? And, and yeah, so I, I did have another question, but it got answered. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just the looks on your faces. Your, the, your faces are saying, man, I'm, maybe I'll say that. I'm not sure. <laughs> but you're processing. So I think the, the talk is good because it's getting everybody thinking. You know? Yeah. On um, Wednesday, we're going to talk about Black Infant Health. Um, and I can't wait to have that conversation with you all. I cannot wait to have that conversation with you all. Um, it's an important one. Mm -hmm. It um, actually will continue the conversation that we're having today. We're not going to talk about COVID, but we're going to continue to talk about people of color and um, why understanding specifically Black infant health um, and Black maternal death is so important to understand um, what happens in that scenario. We'll also do the uh, Sankofa for this week and talk about the themes and we'll do all of that on Wednesday. Um, yeah. Anything more for Miss Tina? I'm good. If you guys have any questions or if I can help you understand anything further, just email me. Hey, guys. One more. Oh, okay. just one more. <laughs> the, sorry. The level of mask, like I know N95 is probably the top one, but what comes after the N95? What you have on right now. The cloth? Yeah. Okay. Because, okay, so I'm sure you've seen the surgical masks. Yes. You've seen those? Yes. Okay, so the surgical mask is just a barrier, just like the one you have on now. It's just a barrier. So that if you cough or sneeze, it's going to go inside that barrier. Right. Now, so, yeah, it'll go inside that barrier. Okay, so... They are suggesting that they're double layer, that they have at least two layers. So if it's a thick cloth, what they mean by that is if it's thick, that's good enough. Whereas a surgical mask is real thin. It's the pores that you should be concerned about. Uh -huh. it's not, the thickness is going to cause you to not be able to breathe. So me... But what, I mean, yeah. what I mean is when they say double layer, yeah. what they mean is... What they mean is it shouldn't be like paper thin, like toilet paper. Right. Yeah, that's a surgical mask, what she has. Yep, yeah, that's it. That's just a barrier. But it works fine. All right. Um, well, again, thank you, Nurse Tina. You were more than I expected. This conversation was very, very oh. good. And I enjoyed it. More questions. The presentation is going to be posted on Canvas. So other students that weren't present today, the class is, uh, I think there's 28 students in the class. So you might get questions from people who uh, weren't present today, but will reference this talk. So, okay, and I'll have my secretary send you over the um, 
references because you know that's a shame i'm totally handicapped without her <laughs> it's good so yeah, when um, you send that to me, then I'll post that presentation for okay. as well. Okay. It's nice meeting you guys. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank you. Bye -bye. It's very informative. Thank Bye. You. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. Bye. See you guys on Wednesday. Stay well. Wait, I have a question uh, for for um for, for Donna. Sorry. It's okay. Um. So. I jumped in the conversation late, and so I wanted to know: did we did we go over the thirteenth at all, or was it just? No, we'll do all of that on Wednesday. Oh, okay, okay. Over the quit, all of that. So okay. we have a a two hour block, and we're probably going to use all of that time to, you know. Okay. Talk about thirteenth. Talk about the the topic for the day. Um, we might even get into some of the discussion questions from the book. So we have two hours to you know, talk about. Oh, I wanted to mention too, I was looking at the discussions for the next chapter. Um, the questions aren't posted. They're not, they will open tonight because I'm actually working in real time. Okay. <laughs> I'm reading it along with you because this class, I just chose the book for this. Um, and it got to me like a week before the class started uh, right along with everyone else. So because I am teaching more than one class, it takes me a moment to get to everything. So that's the only reason why no, it's fine. are not posted, but they will be tonight. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. I had a question as well, Donna. Sure. Um, so my question is, um, you were giving us the pages that we're supposed to read, but yeah. all I have is the digital copy. Um, and so the pages are a little off. Are we doing this by chapter every week? Um, yeah so, yeah so this this week we are doing chapters two and three okay yeah so i appreciate i'm glad you let me know that so i'll actually change that in the information that you see so okay. it, it aligns with that yeah because be, because my um i did my questions they were a day late because i read the i read the pages that you put um not realized that it was the chapter um and I could not find the answers to the questions, and I was just so just baffled. Yeah, yeah. Because we are supposed to talk about the answers in class, but we'll make sure we get to all of that. Sounds right? good. Thank you so very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay. Have a great day, you guys. Thank you. You Thank too. you. All Thank right. you. See you Wednesday. Bye. Right. See you Wednesday. Thank Bye. you. Bye. See you Wednesday. Bye.